Okay, I've entitled the sermon today, Are You Hungry? And um, I feel I need to give a little warning for the sermon today. It's We're going to look at a story in the Bible that maybe is a little bit graphic. So just a little warning there. Maybe, maybe we need an M rating on it or viewer discretion advice. I'm not really sure, but um, just, just to, to let you know that we're... We're looking at something a bit challenging today, but it'll challenge us in our faith and uh, in our walk with Christ. So let's begin. Let's uh, start with prayer, shall we? Let's bow our heads. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we can still meet as, as, as your family, as your brothers, as brothers and sisters, as your children. And Lord, we just pray you'll bless our time. We invite your Holy Spirit into our hearts. And Lord, I just pray that you'll create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from us, Lord. The prayer that David would pray, we pray for ourselves because we need it. And uh, so, Lord, just bless us. Help me today as I share. And I, we, we pray that uh, we'll be inspired. With your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, look, many years ago when I was studying at university, I, I was doing a science degree and I was also helping my mum and dad out in the family bakery business. And uh, it was lots of fun working in the bakery. There was always plenty of food to eat, as you can see there. And, um, but you know, I, I realized that, you know, dangerous bakeries are dangerous places. You got these big mixing bowls, you got sharp knives, hot ovens, lots of things to get injured on. And I remember one time my dad had just cooked a batch of biscuits. He'd taken it straight out of the oven. He used, you know, the, those, uh, oven, oven cloths, big, thick cloths put them in the, the tray and I was sort of emptying everything. I didn't realize it had just come straight out. So I grabbed the tray, bare hands, straight out of the oven, put it down on the desk, and oh man, I I burnt my hands really badly. I had these white marks on my hands. Ran it under water for 20 minutes. They were still there. It took a long time for my hands to heal. So you know, you've got to be careful in bakeries, but I think one of the things we really have to be careful about, well, I had to, was was the food that was on offer. You know, there's lots of amazing food that uh, we, we could eat. I remember I would get up early. You'd start early in the bakery and you'd, you'd get down there. I hadn't had breakfast at home. So I'd get to the bakery and breakfast for me was a chocolate lemington. So I'd maybe have one or two of those. That was breakfast. And then maybe later on in the morning, I'd get a little bit hungry. I might have a, a sausage roll with tomato sauce. That was always nice. And then um, lunchtime, I might have a, a steak and mushroom pie. And then uh, this is all really healthy, isn't it? And then in the afternoon, you know, I might I might have a gingerbread man. We, we made those. I might have a donut or a cream bun. And anyway, it wasn't the uh, most healthiest food that I was that I was having. But, um, you know, I wasn't I wasn't actually that healthy. I was playing a lot of sport, I was fit, but I wasn't healthy, and I realized, you know what, I'm having a lot of sinus, had a lot of sinus problems, you know, congestion, I was seeing the doctor three or four times a year, and I realized, you know, I've got to try and eat a bit better, so I tried to, you know, cut down some of these foods, I'll be honest, now and then, you know, you still have a little treat now and then, but, um, yeah, I, I started to eat a lot better. In fact, I just want to say our pies that we made back then, they were pretty, pretty famous, those pies. We'd have, we'd have people lining up all through the shop, down halfway down the street to get the pies that we were making. We actually had a vegetarian version, which was really nice as well. Um, so, look, I have, I have good memories of, of working there with the family and the bakery business and, and the food that, that we had there. But um, soon after um, that, my wife and I, we went on a trip to her home country, and that is Peru. And as you can see on the screen there, there's, there's, a, there's a place called Machu Picchu. 
It's a beautiful place. It's a it's a city on the top of a mountain. These are actually uh, ruins, if you like. But if you look closely, you can see all the walls and everything's still intact. The whole infrastructure really is still there. Really what's just missing is the thatched uh, roofs on top. This city was only discovered about 100 years ago, and I had the privilege of visiting this place. It's, it was built by the Incas, incredible place in Peru. If you ever have a chance to go there, I recommend getting over to Peru. But um, Peru is a, it's a third world country. And we did spend a lot of time in the capital, which is Lima as well. And it's, it's not the cleanest place. And, um, you know, I ended up getting quite sick. I ended up getting dysentery and diarrhea and it wasn't much fun. Out of the three weeks of my holiday, I think I was sick for two weeks, lying in bed, not very well. And eventually though, I did start to recover. But after Peru, what we did, we went to the US and we went into California. And what a difference. It's like, it's like one extreme to the next. We went from a country that was quite poor and then we ended up in the US and um, I lost about five kilos, I remember, when I got sick over in Peru. But we loved it over there, but it was unfortunate that I did end up getting a bit sick. And um, But I managed to put the weight back on. I found a place in, in California called Taco Bell. I don't know who knows Taco Bell, but I love that place. I used to go there and buy a $1 bean burrito, have a few of those, and put the weight back on and got healthy again. So. Just, just the contrast I remember with, with, with those two countries. And I did some research and I found out something interesting. And that was that the U.S. actually throws out enough food every year to feed every starving person on the planet. I thought, wow, that's quite incredible. And, um, you know, thinking about starving people. Our story today comes from 2 Kings chapter 6 about a famine that God's people would go through. But before we get there, just a warning on the next screen. I want to put up a picture. I know it's hard to look at, hard to see, but this is reality and this is what is happening. We have children that are starving to death. In fact, 10 million children starve to death every year. Now that's about one child every three seconds. So one, two, three, child dies. One, two, three, child dies. One, two, three, child dies. I mean, this, this is quite impacting, isn't it? It's really sad about what's happening in our world today. And, you know, it's not really, a lack of food that is the problem, is it? As we know, it's it's more a lack of love. It's a it's a political problem, but it's hard to see. We need to pray for our children like this. And uh, but look, it happened to God's people as well. Let's open our Bibles to Second Kings chapter six and verse twenty-four. What happened to God's people? They also were hungry. And they also were starving and running out of food. And you can see there on the picture, this is actually the ancient site of Samaria, the capital of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. You know, they often built these cities on hills, easy to defend, easy to see the enemy coming. So so uh, Samaria, is, that's, that's the old site there. And uh, Samaria is on the, on the hill. Let's read verse 24. Second Kings chapter 6, the Bible says here, and it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. So this is the, the Syrian king Ben-Hadad who besieges Samaria. And we can see on the screen there the, the northern kingdom of Israel that's in blue. Samaria, the capital, just in the middle. Remember, the, the kingdom split in two. So we also have the southern kingdom of Judah. In the south, you can see the capital of Jerusalem there. Now, the, the Syrians most likely came from the area of uh, Aram, Damascus. 
don't mix them up with the Assyrians. These are these are different. This is the Syrians we're talking about at this stage. But this is uh, the the place that we're looking at. Let's read verse twenty five. You can see there I've put a bit of a an interesting picture there. Verse twenty five says, and there was a great famine in Samaria, and indeed they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. This is quite incredible, and that here we have God's people starving, and now they're eating and selling donkey's heads and dove droppings. Now, I look at those dove droppings here. That's what they are. Um, that doesn't look too appealing. I mean, I'd, I'd rather have a maybe a chocolate donut rather than that. But this this is what God's people were having: donkeys' heads, dove droppings, and they were paying a lot of money for them, as we can see, as well. Eighty shekels for a donkey's head, five shekels of silver for some dove droppings. And if we have a look. You can see there that um, a quarter of a cab, as the Bible says, it's about half a litre. So you get about half a litre of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. I mean, I don't know if this makes anyone hungry. I doubt it does. But uh, some, some scholars actually had put some doubts on the story. They're sort of saying, well, the Hebrew word is dibyon chinyon. And maybe maybe it was a pea or a bulbous root that they were eating. Surely, surely they weren't having dove droppings. But then interestingly enough, Josephus, the well-known Jewish historian, he makes an interesting point. He says that, you know, during times of famine, times of siege, that eating animal dung was common and was done. Not only animal dung, but human excrement was eaten as well. How desperate had God's people become. It's quite amazing. And But you know, this story, just a warning, it actually gets even worse. And then it will get better. Let's read uh, the next three verses. I put a picture up of my boys when they were a bit younger, a few years ago. But let's now read verse 26. We'll read verses 26 to 29 of 2 Kings 16. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, Help, O Lord, my king. And he said, If the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? In other words, there's no food. There's no wheat in the wine press. There's no, there's no uh, wheat in the threshing floor. There's no grapes in the wine press. It, I can't help you. And he said uh, in verse, and, and the king said to her, verse 28, what is troubling you? Listen to this carefully. And she answered, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today. And we will eat my son tomorrow. Wow, this is incredible. It's like they're planning the menu. Today we're going to have this, tomorrow that, but it's it's human flesh. It's children. Verse 29, what does it say? So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. Of course she has. She doesn't want someone else to eat her son. But as we see in this tragic story, She's happy to eat someone else's son. I mean, let's think about it. Could you do it? Would you want to do it? If you ever got that desperate. I imagine these, these, these children, are, these boys, they're probably only very young. Probably only, I don't know, one or two or three or four. Not, not big enough to fight back, defend themselves. But this is what happens to God's people. A tragic situation. You know, we were created in the image of God, weren't we? But this story shows us a picture of Satan. Shows us a picture of evil. Shows us that Satan really, all he wants 
is death and destruction, but we're going to see God work. And we're going to see something amazing happen. And there's a quote here from Acts of the Apostles, page 146. It says here, man's extremity is God's opportunity. Let's let that sink in a little bit. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. In other words, when it gets really bad for us, that's an opportunity for God to work. When we're at our worst, God is at, our, God is at his best. And we see this happening. We're going to see this happen in the story. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. Let's flip over now to 2 Kings chapter 7. And we'll pick up the story in verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, actually. Then Elisha. Now, Elisha is the, the prophet of the day. In actual fact, if we just go back a little bit, the king of Israel, he got so upset with Elisha that he, he wants Elisha's head. He, he loses his faith. He gets upset. But uh, Elisha comes on the scene in verse 7, in, in chapter 7, verse 1. Then Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time a seer of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. And verse 2, so an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, in fact, you shall eat, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. The, 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 the king's right-hand man, if you like, is saying, what, what's God going to do? Is he going to, you know, make food fall out of heaven? Elisha gives a solemn prediction that this man will see it but he will not eat it and as we see in verse one Elisha says tomorrow a miracle is going to happen I think that should be comforting for us you know today it may be bad today it may be difficult today it may be tough you know we're, we're in lockdown coronavirus is fear and worry but we can take the comfort that tomorrow can be another day and tomorrow God can work a miracle. And we're going to see something incredible happen. Just a recap. So Elisha's prophecy at the moment today, one shekel buys 50 mil of dove droppings or you could get an 80th of a donkey's head for a shekel. Maybe that's the eye. I don't know if you'd like that. But tomorrow. The bless the, the, the promise is, the prophecy is from Elisha that tomorrow a shekel will buy seven kilos of fine flour. How's it going to happen? There is no flour. And a shekel will buy 14 kilograms of barley. That's a, that's a decent sized bag. I remember just coming back to when I used to work in the bakery with my parents. You know, there were those 20 kilo flour bags. Oh, pretty heavy, you know, you lift a few of those uh, throughout the day. There's a lot of, lot of flour there. But the promise is that tomorrow will be better. I think we should always remember that. Tomorrow can be better. And if we continue our story, from 2 Kings chapter 7, we will read now from verse 3. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now, therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall only die. So we've got these lepers, these four men who are not allowed in the city because they've got a disease. They're sick. They have leprosy. And, and everyone else is in the city, locked down, if you like. And then outside, you've got the Syrian army, and these lepers are thinking, we're just going to die out here. Maybe we should go to the Syrians. And let's read verse 5. And they rose at twilight, early in the morning, to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, nobody is there. Wow, what's happened? 
Verse 6, for the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots, the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, look, the king of Israel is hired against us, the king of the Hittites, the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose, fled at twilight, left the camp and tacked their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and they fed for their lives. Amazing miracle has just occurred. The Lord caused the Syrian army to, to hear something. The Lord chased them away. The Lord scared them off. And they left everything behind in their haste. You know, there's a verse in Psalms 118 verse 6, which is one of my favorites. It says, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? A beautiful promise of God's protection that, you know, we serve a God. He's not, he's not up there way, a long way away in the heavens. He's by our side. He's next to us. A very comforting thought from this verse. And then let's read what these lepers did. It's quite incredible. Verse 8 and verse 9. Remember the camp is empty. The Syrians have been scared off by God. And verse 8. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent, ate and drank, and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and you know, it's quite incredible what we've just read. You've got hungry men, lepers who are dying, but there's always time to what? Grab silver and gold and clothing. Human nature. Even when we're half dead, well, we're still looking for the gold, aren't we? But here, here are the lepers. Uh, it's like, you know, they can't believe it. So they're eating, drinking, the gra they're grabbing the gold, the silver, the clothing. They went and hide them. Then they come back for more. They enter another tent. They do the same again. And then they go and hide it. And then they come back. And then I want to read verse 9. And verse 9 is the key for today's sermon. I want you not to miss this. Verse 9 says, Then they said to one another, We are not doing what is right. This is a day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, let us go and tell the king's household. You see, my friends, everyone listening out there, today also is a day of good news. It is good news because we have something that many don't. Christians have Jesus. Christians have the gospel. We have something which can give eternal life. But I challenge you, are you remaining silent like the lepers? How can we remain silent when people are dying, when people are spiritually hungry, when people need comfort and encouragement from God, from the Bible, from the gospel? We have it. We need to share it. And one thing that I read a few years ago, which is impacting for me, and that is this, is that the gospel is one beggar telling another beggar where there is bread. You see, as a Christian, we're, we're not any better. We're not, we're not holy and righteous. We're all sinners. But what we have found is some life. We've found some bread. And the gospel is also one sinner. Telling, telling another sinner where there is bread, where there is life, where there is Christ. Let's keep that in mind. You know, John 6.35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes in me shall never thirst. It's a beautiful promise. And I'm just going to pop up another picture on the screen. Forgive me if it's hard to look at. But this was a photo taken by men who would suffer through the Thailand death camps in World War II. The men who were taken captive by the Japanese. And I, actually, I actually met Len about 20 years ago while working in Sydney. And Len told me 
his story, and his story was that he was one of these men who ended up in a Thailand death camp. He he actually built uh, the famous uh, bridge over the River Kwai. There's a movie about it. There are books written about it as well. He was actually one of the men who built this bridge. But uh, he told me a little bit of his story. I, I met him in the home as I was, as I was canvassing and, and selling Christian books. And uh, he let me in. We sat down. He told me his story. He was 18 years old. And like a lot of men, Back then, he, he wanted to go and fight. So he had pretended to be 21. He got into the army, he was on a ship bound to the Middle East. But uh, what was happening was the Japanese were coming down so quickly through the Malayan Peninsula that Singapore was under threat. So this ship got rerouted to Singapore to defend against the Japanese army, but it was too late. The Japanese overran the island, took Singapore and and Len got taken captive and ended up in a Thailand death camp. And Len told me his, his, his story, his experience. He told me that, as you can see, he lost a lot of weight. He actually ended up weighing 38 kilos when he came out. And that was less than half his original weight. The poor men in the camp, they were, they were worked and starved to death. He told me that they would survive on a bowl of rice. He told me that they would have to stand over a pit. They'd all line up and stand over a pit, straddling over a pit and told to go to the toilet. Now is your time. You go now. Imagine that. I couldn't do that. He told me how they, they, the clothes they wore was just cloth G-strings for three years. That's all he had. And you can see it in the picture. Just a cloth g-string, stripping away the dignity of men made in the image of God. He told me that there was a time one day when a padre, a pastor, if you like, came into his hut. They're all bamboo huts. And this, this padre walks in, looks up to heaven and says, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? The padre turns and walks out of the hut and leans watching him and thinks, man, if a man of God can lose his faith and give up, what hope is there for me? And at that moment, Len decided he would not believe in God anymore. It's a miracle, actually, that Len survived this whole ordeal. He told me that uh, a little bit more about the paper. They had no toilet paper. They had no paper at all. And any paper they found, they would they would get the, the, the cigarette butts of the, the Japanese soldiers. They'd roll them up and try and smoke them. Just a way of numbing the pain. And they were so desperate. He got sick there. He got malaria, dengue fever, dysentery. But he didn't get the dreaded cholera. You see, cholera was the killer in these camps. And Len didn't get that. And he told me one horrific night, 17 men. And this camp died. And one night, and Len told me, they stacked the bodies up outside of his hut. And he came out in the morning, and there all the bodies are. He said, I'll never forget the smell of death. And so Len suffered through something quite incredible. He told me of another story of a, a death camp further north. There were 2,000 men. The Japanese started marching them. 2,000 men. They went on a march, only six of them walked out alive out of 2,000. And one of the last jobs Len had to do was start digging holes. He thought he was digging tunnels, but he was actually digging graves. The Japanese were going to shoot them all and bury them all together. But luckily, the, the atom bomb hit Hiroshima and Len was rescued and I was just listening to this, this guy's story. I could not believe what I was hearing. And I thought, man, he, how can I help him? What can I show him? I had a bag full of good books. I showed him this book and that book and so on and so forth. But he just kept shaking his head. He, he didn't want anything. I showed him great controversy, Desire of Ages, and some of our powerful books. He didn't want them. Signs Magazine. Take a Signs Magazine, Len. He didn't want it. Didn't want anything. I said, I had a, I had a little tract, a little, a little 
thing to read. Didn't want that either. I thought, wow, I don't know what to do. And then something came to my mind. I remembered a story in the book Today, Tomorrow and You. And I remember that it talks about the Daniel 2 prophecy. As you know, that there's the prediction. Daniel predicted 500 uh, BC, the nations that would rule the world, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, and so on, that after Rome, there would be no more ruling kingdom over that part of the world, that Europe would never, ever be brought together by a kingdom, according to the Daniel prophecy. And I said, look, Len, you were part of that prophecy because you, you, you helped to fight those powers that were trying to, to rule that area. I said, you were part of a prophecy of God. And then at that moment, he said, really? I said, yeah. He said, okay, show me. And he grabbed the book. He looked at the book. He said, okay, how much is this one? He bought the book cash. And it was a just incredible experience. I asked, I said, Len, can I pray with you? He said, yeah, okay. And we started to pray. And as I'm praying, I'm, I'm just thanking God for blessing Len and looking after him and bringing him through this. And, and that there's the promise that one day there'll be no more pain or death or suffering. And at that moment, I heard this, oh, this voice comes out of Len. He, he starts crying and He's so emotional, and I just felt that um, there was a lot that he had kept inside of him, and it came out during that prayer. I just felt that it was a moment of healing for Len, and I thank you for the opportunity. Thank God for the opportunity that I could meet him, and I just pray that that book will encourage him and he'll find his faith again. But let's come back to our story now, 2 Kings chapter 7. And we're going to read verses 10 to 14. Where are we at? Verses 10. So they went and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, saying, we went to the Syrian camp. So these are the lepers, remember? And surprisingly, no one was there, not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied in the tents intact. And the gatekeepers called out and they told it to the king's household inside. Verse 12, read with me. So the, so the king arose in the night and said to his servants, let me now tell you what the Syrians have done. They know that we are hungry. Therefore, they've gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying when they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the camp. You see, the king doubts. The king thinks it's an ambush. He cannot believe. The Syrians have gone and there's food and everything there. In verse 13, and one of his servants answered and said, please let several men take five of the remaining horses which are left in the city. Look, they may either become like all the multitude of Israel that are left in it, or indeed, they, I say, they may become like all the multitude of Israel left from those who are consumed. So let, let us send them and see. In verse 14, so they took two chariots, with horses, I'm surprised they haven't eaten the horses yet. And the king sent them in the direction of the Syrian army saying, go and see, the, the, the king does not believe, the king has to see. Sometimes we don't always have to see to have faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Sometimes you've got to believe without seeing. You got to trust God. You know, I find it interesting. Sometimes you, you'll meet an atheist and they will tell you, you know, I only believe in what I can see. I want some evidence. I said, well, you better tie yourself to the table then. I say, why? What? I say, you know, you might float away because of you can't see any gravity, can you? I say, no, but it's there. You see the effects of it. You see the evidence of it, but you can't actually see gravity, but you believe it. Just like God. We see God working. We may not see him, but we can see him working. We can see the evidence of the way he is interacting in our lives. Let's continue verse 15 now of Second Kings 7. And they went after them to the Jordan, and indeed all the road was full of garments and weapons which the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. So the messengers returned 
and told the king of verse 16, this is it. Then the people went out and plundered the tents of the Syrians. So a seer of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two seers of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Elisha's prophecy comes true. The next day, the prophecy is fulfilled. What Elisha said comes to be, you know, it's quite incredible that that's how God can work. He can take us from little to much, from nothing to abundance, from death to life, from being lost to being saved. That's how God works. And I think I'm preaching to myself right now to remember that. And maybe to everyone listening. God is a miracle working God. If you're struggling now, if you need help, he is there to help you. And look, you look at Elisha. I like Elisha. Probably one of my favorite prophets. Um, I won't tell you why I like Elisha. Maybe because he's bald and I'm bald as well. But I remember what Elisha did once. He was getting teased by some young people. And Elisha sent a couple of beers after them to sort them out. You know, don't don't tease me either. I'd appreciate that. But I like Elisha. And if, it's a powerful message that he's given for us today. And I just want to share a, another story. As I was doing some literature ministry, I had the blessing of having my son come with me. This is a few years ago. And we're visiting homes. It's we're working the golden hours, if you like. This is sort of 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. These are your best hours. And we're going door to door and visiting folk. And Keenan, he meets a man. I'm with him. And he's, he's canvassing the book Great Controversy. It's a powerful book. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. You know, I believe besides the Bible, the, the Great Controversy is probably the next book you need to read. It actually talks about what's happening right now in this world. Anyway, Keenan, Keenan's canvassing the book Great Controversy and the man's listening and then he asks, well, how much is it? And uh, Keenan says, well, people normally give about $10. He goes, okay. It's just a, you know, it's a paperback. So he goes inside but when he comes back, he says, hey, you, you got me at a weak moment. Here's 20. And Keenan was shocked. It's like, wow. I only asked for 10. He gave me 20. God gave me more. God got doubled his money, if you like. I think that's sometimes something that we need to remember, that we serve a big God who can do big things for us. And Ephesians 3.20 is a text I want to share. It says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. You see, we have a God who can, can do more than we can imagine, more than we ask for, more than what we can think. But if you look at that text in Ephesians 3.20, there is a condition to it. And the condition is according to the power that works in us. In other words, the Holy Spirit, his power needs to be working in our lives. We need to be trusting God. But it's a powerful story that we've just read through about Elisha and God's people. And, you know, Second Kings 7.17, 7, we talked about the, the king's right-hand man, the man who would doubt, the prophet of Elisha. What happens to this poor man who doubts? Well, verse 17 says, Now the king had appointed the officer on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate, but the people trampled him in the gate, and he died, just as the man of God had said who spoke when the king came down to him. You see, this man, he's, he's like a leader, he's like a leader in the church, if you like, and he's trampled at the gate because of a lack of faith. He does not believe that God can work a miracle. He sees the bread, maybe even smells it, but he never gets to eat it. Tragic situation. I think maybe sometimes we've got to be careful that we don't doubt the word of God. 
Are we doubting his word? Are we doubting his prophets? Are we doubting maybe this lady, Ellen White, a prophet who was given especially for the end of time? It's interesting that she, she makes a statement, she makes a comment that she wouldn't have had to give her message or her testimonies if the people of God had been actually following their Bibles. The only reason she was given the messages because we weren't reading this in the first place. We've got to make sure we stay close to the word. Read our Bibles. Second Chronicles 2020, as we start to finish up now. It says here, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. There's a blessing to believing the word of God and his prophets. A blessing of prosperity. And what, is, what is Christ doing now then? You see, Jesus is up in heaven. He's ministering in heaven. He's, he's forgiving sins. He's He's cleansing from uh, us from sin. He's blotting out sin. He's doing a special work. But you know, he won't always do that. At some stage, he's going to stop that ministry of intercession. At some stage, he will stop forgiving sins. At some stage, probation will close and Christ will return to this planet. You know, when, when that probation closes, when that time comes, the Bible tells us there's going to be a famine again. But this is not going to be a famine for food. This is not going to be a thirst for water. It's going to be a famine for hearing the word of God. Now, if we turn over to Amos chapter 8, verse 11 and 12, Isaiah, Joel, Amos, let's look up Amos chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. We want to read something very interesting. Amos 8, verse 11 and 12. The, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, not a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. In verse 12, they shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. They shall not find it. Because the preaching has stopped. The study has stopped. You can't, you can't share your faith anymore. Probation is closed. Whoever is decided has decided for God. Whoever has rejected God has rejected. The decisions are made. There's a famine in the land. It's a spiritual famine. And let's just remember when this prophecy was given, it was given during a time of prosperity. Israel were comfortable, materialistic. Amos was a farmer. He was called to give the prophecy at 775 BC. Everything's just going so well. But they're idol worshippers. They're attached to the world. And the Assyrian army starts coming. It's approaching and God's people suddenly see the army coming. Suddenly they want to, to get right with God, but it's too late. It's too late. Israel are captured 722 BC and they will never ever rise to the state they were before. God's people are captured. You know, I wonder, how about us today? How about God's people today? Are we sitting comfortable, materialistic, prosperous in, in, in many ways? But are we hungry for the word of God? Because if, we, if we're not hungry now, and we're not feeding now. We're going to be very hungry later. I just want to read with you a, a couple of quotes here. This is on Christ Object Lessons 228. The world is perishing for want of the gospel. I think that's true. There is a famine for the word of God. There are few who preach the word unmixed with human tradition. Though men have the Bible in their hands, they do not receive the blessing God has placed in it for them. 
the Lord calls upon his servants to carry his message to the people. It's incredible. You have the word of God in your hand, but you don't receive the blessing because we don't read it. Challenging thought. We are not to wait for souls to come to us. We must seek them out where they are. When the word is being preached in the pulpit, the work has just begun. There are multitudes who will never be reached by the gospel unless it is carried to them. What is it telling us? It's telling us then when this, this, this gospel is preached in the pulpit, that's the beginning of the work. What's the end of the work? The end of the work is when we go out seeking people to share the gospel with them. The great controversy, page 353. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the, the, the power of the great delusion that takes the world captive. And it goes on that we need to be prepared for the time, the sifting of temptation. Are the people of God so firmly established upon his word that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses? Would they in such a crisis cling to the Bible and the Bible only? This is something for us to seriously consider because the devil is about. He's causing chaos and problems, destruction. Satan will, if possible, prevent, prevent them from obtaining a preparation to stand in that day. He will so arrange affairs as to hedge up their way, entangle them in earthly treasures, cause them to carry a heavy, wearisome burden that their hearts may be overcharged with the cares of this life. And the day of trial might come upon them as a thief. Are we prepared? Are we hungry? Are we sharing? Let's not be selfish with the bread that we have, with Jesus that we have. We need to share what we have. And I want to just finish up with a powerful promise from Isaiah. Chapter 33, verse 15 and 16. Let's uh, go in our Bibles there. Isaiah 33, 15 and 16. Because if we're with Christ, if we've given our hearts and lives to him, we have nothing to worry about. Verse 15 and 16. Isaiah 33. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing bloodshed, shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Verse 16 is the promise. He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. God will provide. He will meet your needs. I mean, this could this could be a spiritual in a spiritual sense, but it's also in a physical sense as well. And our needs can be met. And our final text actually is Daniel 12, verse 1. Appreciate your time and patience with me today. Let's go to our final text. Daniel 12, verse 1. So that's just after Ezekiel. Daniel 12. Chapter 12 and verse 1. What does the Bible tell us? The Bible says here that at that time Michael shall stand up. Michael, that's Jesus. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. The time of trouble that we're talking about here, that Daniel is talking about, is a time when probation is closed. And there's a famine in the land. A famine for, for spiritual food. And at that time your people shall be delivered. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we can come to you. Anytime, any place, anywhere, anyhow. We thank you, Lord, that you hear us. We thank you, Lord, that you've promised you'll never leave us nor forsake us. I just want to pray, Lord, for everyone who's listening. Please, Lord, strengthen them. Please, Lord, encourage them through this time to know that tomorrow can be a better day. But it must be a day 
And uh, we just pray that you will bless us, you are safe, faithful until you come in Jesus' name. Amen.